Proverbs chapter 16 tonight. From Proverbs chapter 16 uh, down through about chapters 22 uh, and verse 16 are about 191 verses. And in these 191 verses, you will see there are comparisons and similarities between what some would consider false and truth or truth and false type of comparisons. And here we see the picture in chapter 16 as we kind of titled the message tonight in regards to this chapter as I titled the message, The Way of Committed Life. And I took the title from verse 3, but the way of committed life. The proverb goes on to say this, the preparations of the heart belong to man. Some translations might say the plans belong to man. But notice how it says here, the answer of the tongue is from the Lord. The picture that we find in regards to this way of a committed life is really what the scriptures direct us toward. Here in the proverb, the reminder is very clear that yes, we have plans, we have ideas, we have purposes in our own lives. But in reference to the one who is walking in the fear of the Lord, as we can say, that reminder that often comes up throughout the Proverbs, like in verse 6, where it says, and by the fear of the Lord, one departs from evil. This constant reminder. Within the framework of the fear of the Lord for the life of the believer, we do have plans, we have desires, at times we um, make plans. But notice here that it says the preparations or the plans of the heart belong to man. God does not have a problem with us saying, hey, you know, my desire is to do this or do that. Um, I guess the best way to describe this is even a person's career, per se. Some might not always choose the career path of ministry, but they choose other career paths in life. And uh, just because a person becomes a doctor but is not a pastor doesn't mean that they're not doing the will of God. Uh, just because maybe a person might have gone to, you know, school or college or whatever to educate themselves in a certain type of field or career, and they pursue that, and maybe they're not doing full-time ministry per se, does not mean that they're not in the will of God. Um, I remember for about nine years, I worked for a college, and one of the things that one of the professors at the college said was, he says, you know, the reason why I work for this school and this was a man who studied all of his time in schools of theology and basically pursued that. So his degrees, his doctorate was in theology. But in the school that we were at, it was not a theological school, nor was it a school of uh, Bible study. They had Bible. They did have a certain aspect of that, but it was actually a liberal arts college. It was all general ed courses taught from a biblical worldview. So the school would not prepare you to be a pastor, but it would prepare you to go into the work field or into the workforce. And a lot of the students went in various directions. Some became teachers, some went into nursing, some went into law school, others went into accounting, business administration, and all these various things. And I remember one day speaking to this, uh, you know, this professor who is a dear friend of mine, and he says, you know, he says, you know what, bro? He goes, here's how I see it. Not everybody is going to be the senior pastor of a church, or not every man. And not every person is going to be a missionary. Not every person is going to be a worship leader or a men's group leader or a women's group. So he went down the whole list of ministry, and he says, not everybody can be that. But what we can be is we can be children of God in the world, no matter where we are or what we're doing. And he says, think about it this way. We might not be a school of theology, but we will be a school who teaches from a biblical worldview that these teachers, nurses, lawyers, whatever they go off to do after they graduate from here, we're sending Christians into the world to do these types of jobs, but their hearts are married to Christ. He says, this is actually a ministry in and of itself. So he says, you know, these are plans that people have. 
And so this is kind of the picture here. The preparations of the heart belong to the Lord. You see, we can plan things, and ultimately, man is really under the sovereignty of God. One of the privileges that we have as being created in the image of God, like Genesis 1 says, is the ability to have these plans and make these plans. But it says here, the answer of the tongue is from the Lord. So human responsibility is always subject to the sovereignty of God. And some people say, well, what if I make a bad decision? Anybody ever wonder, what if I make the wrong decision? Here's what I will tell you because of this verse. I, I've often said this in people, even here as I've preached throughout the years, people have said, well, I don't know how I take that. But here's what I say. We all have to make decisions. We most of the time maybe don't make the right decisions. But even a bad decision. God doesn't cast us aside. He will still work in the midst of that bad decision and ultimately will fulfill his purpose. As a matter of fact, as we read a little bit further, we even see, as you go down a little bit, that even the wicked, that even they themselves, in their day of doom, their day of judgment also brings glory to God. It's an interesting dynamic. So regardless of what decision is made, because God is sovereign and he is who he is, okay? Even in the life of the Christian, the privilege that you and I have is that, yes, there's safety in wisdom, there's safety in trusting the word of God, but we're not always going to make the right decisions. But rest assured that God has a way because of who he is. He's the Lord, he's God, of working those things out and ultimately even using a bad decision for his honor and for his glory. It's an interesting thing. And this is what I often tell people. The bad decisions are not surprises to God. He knew the bad decision before you even made the bad decision. <laughs> the preparations of the heart belong to man, but the answer of the tongue is from the Lord. I'm, I'm just reminded so much of one's heart and speech, as the Bible says, are so closely related. Remember in Proverbs chapter 4, we see the same dynamic of this in verses 23, Proverbs 24, 23. It says, keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it springs the issues of life. Put away from you deceitful mouth and put perverse lips far from you. Keep your heart with all diligence. For out of it springs the issues of life. So the tongue is from the Lord. And this, this idea here would remind us that even in the midst of whatever we plan and purpose for the child of God, you know, that is a reminder that the Lord does not allow us to go too far beyond. He's always keeping us within um, the premises of his will, his purpose, his plan, even in our mistakes and even in our mishaps. The Bible says in verse 30 of Proverbs 21, it says, There is no wisdom or understanding or counsel against the Lord. The horse is prepared for a day of battle, but deliverance is of the Lord. Listen to that. So they, they can notice that even an army can assemble together. Even an army can prepare for battle. Ultimately, they're going to get victory because of the Lord God. Now, we hear that passage, some trust in chariots, some trust in horses, but we will trust in the Lord, right? Well, that's that same dynamic. You see, for the one who walks in the fear of the Lord and practices this wisdom, the answer really from these plans or the preparations of the heart belong to man, but the answer of the tongue, listen to this, an answer of wisdom belongs to the Lord. All the ways of a man are pure in his own eyes. And isn't that so true? That this picture here is at times we can outwardly project something, but it is the inward motives that we have a hard time seeing. But there's one who doesn't have a hard time seeing the inward motives of man. It's the Lord God. All the ways of man are pure in his own eyes. In other words, the motives behind his actions... You know, one might, might think what he is doing is okay, 
but the Lord weighs the spirits. You see, the Lord determines the true motives of the heart. You know, I remember years ago, sitting at a pastor's conference, this was probably like, I want to say 2008. And I'll never forget <coughs> hearing, um, I believe it was Pastor Chuck that was speaking to all of us pastors. And one of the things he said about, you know, ministry was he says about churches. Um, and, and, and as I've stated before, this always happens. Pastors conferences, it doesn't matter where, it doesn't matter, you know, who's there. When pastors get together, the conversation of church attendance, when they ask you, how's your church doing? They're asking you, how big is your church? It's, it's just the conversations they have. So this, this last Friday and Saturday, I was at the pastor's conference, and sure enough, that conversation came up. So how's the church doing? I said, good. That's, that's just the way I wanted to answer it. It's doing good. That's it. And then they patted me on the back, you know, like, like are, are people coming? I'm like, yeah. You guys open? Yeah. Well, is it full? Is it? I just says, bro, we're blessed. I don't know what to tell you, man. We're online. We're, we're live in session, you know. It's like, wow, you know. So I, I, I thought to myself, it's the same old thing, you know. And then all the messages really were encouraging because they were reminding pastors and leaders that, you know, the church today has obviously globally faced something. That it's not now like a regular pastor's conference where you hear all these stories of all these blessed churches that are busting out the seams and these, you know, outrageous budgets and this production they have going on. Everybody's speaking the same thing. So it kind of put all churches at an even playing field, big and small. And the messages were encouraging pastors of congregations of all sizes. But I always get back to this one thing. And I was sitting there and I was reminded of this. I remember Pastor Chuck telling all of us pastors at a pastor's conference. He says, when you pray for a big church, check your motives. What do you want more people for? Because you want more money? Or you want people to talk about you? And mention your name, that your church is a big church. When ultimately it's not our church, nor is it your church. It's the Lord's church. And whatever he entrusts you with, be responsible with that. And be happy with that. And you know, I'm, I'm often reminded of this in all of this. To always check the motives of your heart. Even in trusting in things, you know, really ask yourself, why am I really praying this way for this? I mean, ultimately, what is its intended purpose or aim? Now, the Lord also, on another note, the Lord will also reveal the motives of one's heart. You know, when we think about what Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12 says about the word of God, in verse 13 after it explains the power of God's word, it also says in verse 13 that all things are open and naked before the Lord. There is nothing hidden from God, even the motives of man's heart. And so, yes, all the ways of man are pure in his own eyes. But what is the motive behind that plan or that way? So the Lord weighs the spirit. In other words, he determines the motive. So that good thing to always do and say, you know, I need to check my motives. You know, because sometimes we have the tendency to perhaps maybe try to manipulate something, right? Because we want something to go our way. And you might get it. But here's what I will tell you. If the motives are not right, even though you achieve it, it doesn't feel right. Because the motives were never coming from a pure place. They were coming from selfish desires and ambitions that most likely were not from the Lord, but of the flesh. And what I will say is that you might obtain it, you might get it, you might possess it for a moment, but it's short-lived. When the motives are in line, the heart is in line, the Lord is in tune, and you honor the Lord. Listen to this. It doesn't matter how great or how small, when the motives are right, it is fulfilling through and through. He goes on to say in verse 3, he says, commit your works to the Lord and your thoughts will be established. This is a verse here that, um, you know, commit your ways, commit your role, 
you know, commit your works to the Lord, uh, these types of things uh, before the Lord. And it says, and your thoughts will be established. The blessed benefit of committing things to the Lord. When I looked at this, I was reminded of what David said in Psalm 37. I, I always love that psalm because it's a psalm that people often misquote. And in Psalm 37, we're reminded of David when he says, and he shall give you the desires of your heart, right? So we often tell people, yes, you know, be praying for that. God will give it to you. Why wouldn't he, you know? And the Bible does say, after all, that he gives you the desires of your heart. And we often, often refer to this and we say, does God truly give us the desires of our heart? And I'll tell you this, I am thankful that God has not given me some of the desires of my heart. Because my desires are not always good. I know none of you guys have an issue with that. You guys' desires are always on point and really good. And you guys are just pleasing to the Lord in that way. But aren't you thankful that God has not given us every desire that we have in our heart? Because if we can be honest kind of going back to the motives behind perhaps things that we're thinking or things that we want to do. If our motives are not always pleasing before the Lord and God highlights those things, then that clearly shows that our desire is not where it needs to be. But here's what I think is amazing. David writes this psalm and David is speaking in regard to the position that the righteous have. And what does it mean to commit your works to the Lord? Well, well David put it this way. You know, David was not a young man at this time. David was older in life. Verse 25 of chapter 37 says, I have been young and now I am old. Uh, David is not talking from this excited position of having a relationship with the Lord. and just like, hey, it's all good. It's exciting. You know, it's like that, you know, that Christian that they just get saved and they are just so excited to tell everybody about Jesus and they're just going around and you, you got you to hear this and you got to, you know, come on, come to church and all your problems will go away. And I'm just like, the honeymoon's going to be over pretty soon, man. <laughs> and then reality sets in, right? And all of a sudden you start experiencing some trials and some adversity in your walk. But the good thing is we have the Lord, we have his grace, we have his goodness with us. But those trials and those things that we face, it doesn't feel as good as it once did when we first came to faith. And remember when you first came to faith, how you were just always reading the word, nobody had to tell you? I mean, maybe some of you remember what it was like when you couldn't wait to get in the Bible because you just wanted to learn more about God. And you're like, there's not enough hours in the day to, to be able to, to read the word or, or to go to church or to be in ministry or to go to church on a Sunday night after going on Sunday morning. Going to church twice in one day is not a bad thing. <laughs> it's okay. It's the Lord's day. But, but here's the point. I mean, remember that. Now, I remember when I was just devouring books like crazy. I was so hungry. And I thought to myself, I could never get tired of this. Has anybody ever said that? I said that about the things of the Lord. I said that about this. Now, this has nothing to do with God and his power and, his, and who he is. God is God. And he's not failed, not one of us, nor he ever can. But in my mind, I thought, I could never. This, this is amazing. How come people don't know this stuff? Now, listen, people have been Christians far longer than I had. And the church had experienced so much of its existence for over 2,000 years, right? And yet here I am acting like, you know, just 20 years ago, like this is the first time the church has ever experienced this stuff. And then time went on. Those books started to collect dust. And I thought like, well, I already read it. There's no need to double back. I know what's there already. And thank God I did. Some more time went on. The new books that would come out to encourage the body. Get it. I'd read it. I'd put it up on the shelf. And it wasn't until about maybe, I want to say five years ago, six years ago, that I started to realize that I needed to reread and go back through some of those books. And I started to realize that there was things in there that I stopped doing. In the same way, in reading the word of God, I started to realize that I got to the point where it's like I've read through the entire Bible 
for the last, you know, nine years. I just pick a different translation every year. And I read through the entire word. I prepare sermons for the church here, prepare studies and, you know, guest speak sermons, you know, wherever the Lord might have me doing ministry or whatever the case might be. And my handling of the word of God became, you know, this thing in which, well, I know what that says. And you can lose that excitement. It has nothing to do with the power of God. It has everything to do with the heart of man. And ultimately what happens is we, we, we begin to lose this zeal for the Lord and the things of the Lord. And this is why we need to constantly ask the Lord for a renewed sense of his Holy Spirit. That's what you really need. You need a fresh work of the Spirit. And listen, you can't manufacture that. You know, I, there was a season where I said, you know, well, I'm just going to read more. I just got to do it. I got I to gotta press in and I'm just going to do it. So I crack open the word. I'd start reading. And don't get me wrong. I would find more stuff out and everything. But I'm like, there's something missing. And what it was, it was a renewed work of the Holy Spirit in my life. And then I was reminded in the book of Acts where, where Peter and many of the apostles were, were constantly renewed by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit didn't just fall in Acts chapter 3. The Holy Spirit came upon them on more than one occasion. And then it was like, wow, those days of excitement when you're young and on fire for the Lord, then ministry happens the Christian life happens. Trials, adversity take place. What happens to the excitement? Some would say, well, it wanes, it dies out. But God has not lost his power. But now you look back and you can say, listen, I know what that's like. David is looking back and he's saying, hey, listen, those days of excitement and all those things, it was all good. But listen, reality is going to set in one day. And David says in verse one, do not fret because of evildoers, nor be envious of the workers of iniquity. You know, when you're young and walking with the Lord, and what does it mean to commit your ways to the Lord? You have no problem with commitments. You want to do everything for Jesus. You know, those new converts, those, those are the, they're, they're the coolest people to be around. But I think <clears throat> every mature leader should disciple them before you just thrust them out there in ministry. They need to be discipled because it's not about the output, it's about longevity. Disciples last a long time. If you just throw them out there and they have not been discipled, they'll burn out before you know it because they don't realize that it's not, you know, the quantity, but it's the quality. It's, it's not the amount of time, uh, you know, that, that we spend, but it's, the time that we spend with the Lord and the focus. Now, listen, this is why commitment is so important. He, here, the proverb is saying that if you commit your works to the Lord, if you do this, there's benefits that the Lord pays. Commitment is not a short term thing. It is a long term thing. Now, think about this for a moment here. David says, don't fret. The word fret means to burn up, to 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 glow. He's saying, don't come undone and don't be overworked. Listen to this. Because of evildoers. Nor be envious of the workers of iniquity. Like in other words, man, God, you need to, you need to deal with them now. You need to handle this now. I'm out here, you know, doing this for you, living righteously. Lord, just deal with evil now in the world. Listen, God has a purpose. He has a plan. It's all going to be done according to his timing. David says, when you see all this stuff happening, listen, child of God, don't fret. Don't come undone. Don't get overworked. Listen, he says in verse two, they shall soon be cut down like grass and wither as the green herb. But here's what you can do. They will soon be cut down like grass. Soon be means that God has a purpose and a plan even for the wicked. Just like God has a purpose and a plan for the righteous. So in other words, you know what David is really saying? Don't get in the way of God's plan. Don't try to change what God is doing. The Bible says in James chapter 1, verse 17, that he is the unchanging one. So what is he saying here? Rather do this. When the world gets more wicked, life gets more confusing, 
things become more crazy, David says, trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and feed on his faithfulness. Think about that for a moment. You might say, how can I do that with all this going on? Well, all this that's going on is not your burden to carry. That's why David says, don't fret. Don't, don't try to overwork yourself with something that's out of your control. But rather, trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land. Feed on his faithfulness. Now, this is David. Listen to this. Talking as an old man, looking back on the span of his life and realizing there were just some things I wasted my time on. When you waste your time on things that are already in God's control, even when the flesh and the world and Satan himself makes you think that God is not in control, you're working against the Lord rather than resting and trusting in him. See, sometimes we think working against God is like coming against certain things. No, even how we respond in life as being his children. As Terry was saying here, that one day we're going to be in his presence and literally be his children in his presence. But we are his children now as well. And we trust in that. Now, it's not to say not to pray for what's going on. Pray, but don't fret. Trust in the Lord. Look at what he says. And then he says this. Here's another thing you can do. Rather than fret, he says, trust in the Lord. The second thing he says to do, delight yourself also. He doesn't say, you know, some people say, delight yourself in the Lord and he'll give you the desires of your heart. They just butcher that verse. That is not true. God does not give you the desires of your heart just like that. It doesn't work that way. It's a misinterpretation of that passage. What he's saying here is trust in the Lord. Delight also. You can trust in the Lord. In a sense, it's kind of like this. You know how they say when we give. Don't give grudgingly. In a sense, you're still doing the trusting part by the act of giving. But if you're doing the act, trusting that, you know, this is what God tells you to do. But then you're kind of like, the Bible says don't do it at all. To trust in the Lord means to also delight in that. Meaning that you have put to rest your insecurities, your anxieties, your stresses and your worries. You find joy and fulfillment, listen to this, and contentment as you delight in the Lord. What brings delight in your life? What is it that is fulfilling and satisfying? This is what David is saying. You trust in the Lord, delight yourself in the Lord also. Listen to this. And then look what it says. And he shall give you the desires of your heart. So listen to this. You might say, okay then. So I'm going to trust in the Lord and delight myself in the Lord and then he'll give me the desires of my heart. Well, let's stop there. David doesn't stop there. David says, commit. I love this here. The idea here is to roll off onto complete dependence. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in him. Listen to this. He's not done. And he shall bring it. What? The desire of your heart. To pass. Pay attention to what David says. Rather than fret and come undone, trust in the Lord. Delight yourself also in the Lord. Commit your way to the Lord. So now when you share with someone and you say, God will give you the desires of your heart, stop and say, let me show you what that really means and what that looks like. Because let me explain to you why this is so important. It leads to something. The opposite of, fret, of fretting or coming undone is resting. Look at what David says. He shall bring forth your righteousness as the light and your justice as the noonday. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. And how do we know this is tied into this? Do not fret. Look at what David says immediately after. Do not fret. So here's what it looks like, guys. When we commit our work to the Lord, we commit our ways to the Lord. This is what it looks like. Trusting in the Lord. Delighting ourselves in the Lord. Committing our ways to the Lord. Listen to this. And resting in the Lord. 
When we do this and we wait patiently for him, this picture here of calm surrender. Remember the psalmist writes in Psalm 62 about this picture of calm surrender. And I, I think it's fitting for what we're seeing here. It says, my soul waits silently for God alone, for my expectation is from him. He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be moved. Now, it even goes on to say here, in God is my salvation and my glory, the rock of my strength and my refuge is in God. Trust in him at all times, you people. Notice how it says all times. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. Selah. Stop and think and meditate upon that. I think Psalm 37 has some Selah moments in it. And I think that a Selah moment would be right here where David then says, do not fret. Selah. Stop and think about that for a moment. So the benefits of committing your ways to the Lord or committing your works to the Lord, according to Proverbs 16, look at this, says, when you do this, your thoughts will be established. According to Psalm 37, when you do this, God will give you the desires of your heart. And let me help you with that. How many of you guys would like better desires in your heart tonight? Okay, so here's the good thing about this passage here. He's not talking about refurbished desires. He's not talking about your desires getting saved and now they're redeemed. No, he's talking about his desires that when you and I, as his children, trust in the Lord, we delight ourselves in the Lord, we commit our ways to the Lord, and we rest in the Lord, with doing that, we open ourselves up to receive what the Lord has for us. And that means that in a very powerful and supernatural way, God deposits his desires in our heart. And before you know it, we're so in tune with the Lord that we begin to speak out what God has planted in our heart. And the Bible says God is faithful even when we are faithless, for he cannot deny himself. When you speak that desire out, God responds because it's his word. And isn't that what the psalmist says? Have you just ever thought about that for a moment? You know when the Bible says to meditate upon the word of God? How many of you guys have ever seen the word meditate in the Bible, right? And some of you are just kind of like, we're supposed to meditate as Christians? It's not the meditation that you think, you know, where we're sitting down Indian style, crossing our legs and humming away. And <laughs> That's not that meditation. The word meditate means to speak the same thing. God encourages you to speak his word to him. That's why the Bible says all the promises of God, and there's thousands of promises in the Bible, all the promises of God are yes and amen in Christ Jesus. So tonight, if you feel that the desires or the things that are weighing heavy in your life are, are overwhelming and consuming, David would say this to you. If you wanted to talk to King David, he would say, listen, I'm, I'm not young. I've lived life. I've experienced the highs and the lows. And listen to this. Read the Psalms. I, I love that the Lord allowed David's Psalms, even in his sin, God allowed him to write these Psalms of repentance. But even as a man of God, David wrote Psalms of despair. And sometimes where he was just like, I'm out of my mind right now. David experienced highs and lows, depression and anxiety. And times he felt distant from the Lord. Not because God was far from him, but it was the things that David was wrestling in his life. There was nothing that you can come to David with and say, oh, you don't understand what I'm going through. David will tell you this. Hey, listen, I have been young and now I'm an old. But I'll tell you, here's how you do it. Trust in the Lord. Delight yourself also in him. Commit your ways to him. And rest in the Lord. And he will give you the desires of your heart. He will do this so faithfully. So the proverb, the encouragement there, commit your works to the Lord. I think this is an amazing thing. And your thoughts will be established. Your desires will come from the Lord. Listen to this. Blessedness comes from committing our ways to the Lord. Verse 4 says, the Lord has made all for himself. I love that. 
The Lord has made all for himself. You know, we often quote this passage of scripture, but I would say this is probably the best reference to this verse. In Romans chapter 8, the Bible says this in regards to Proverbs 16, 4. In Romans 8, 28, we know this passage. Many of us quote it. It says, for we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. For all things. Now remember I even said, even when we make these bad decisions, because we are his, God fulfills his purpose some way, somehow. Yeah, you might experience loss and lack, but you're not forsaken. It, it goes back to that thing for the Christian, that you can choose your sin because it's not news to any of you. Christians sin. But the day is going to come when we're not going to wrestle with this sin nature anymore. We're going to be completely freed and delivered from it. But it's not a license to sin. But it puts us in this category of you can choose your sin, but you can't choose the consequences of your sin. And even in those bad decisions, not just sin, but just decisions that perhaps maybe might take you a little bit longer. Listen, there are some decisions that you can make that will only be like an 11 day journey. Or there are some decisions that'll have you going in circles and cause you to make an 11 day journey, a 40 year experience. I don't know about you guys, but I want the 11 day journey over the 40 years. Amen. So you see, did God forsake the children of Israel in the wilderness? No, he didn't. He constantly demonstrated his mercy and his grace to them. And ultimately we see here that this is kind of this picture of man plans his ways, right? But the answer of the tongue is from the Lord. Human responsibility is constantly under and subject to the sovereignty of God, even with his people. Then it says, yes, even the wicked for the day of doom. <laughs> Think about that whole picture here of the wicked will also bring God glory in the day of their judgment. That's what Romans chapter 9 and verses 17 through 23 teach. Everyone proud in heart is an abomination to the Lord. Though they join forces, none will go unpunished. You know, people say, you know, we got to get in there and we got we to stop this because the more they grow, the stronger they will get. What is the proverb saying here? It doesn't matter how big or how many join hands together. It doesn't matter how great or how big it might be. It doesn't matter how, who comes together for the purpose of whatever wicked and evil things that are taking place. The proverb is saying here, every one proud in heart is an abomination to the Lord. Though they join forces, none will go unpunished. No matter how great, how long their reign of terror lasts, ultimately the Lord will deal with all. In mercy and truth, atonement is provided for iniquity. By the fear of the Lord, one departs from evil. I love this picture here that atonement is provided for iniquity. Listen, tonight, we're going to take some time to, to consider this atonement and what this looks like. But the whole picture here, when it says that in mercy and truth. This is, this is in who God is. This is God's provision. Atonement is provided for iniquity. Now, in Leviticus chapter 16, there's quite a bit in the first you know, 30 verses of this chapter. But we see that the Lord instructs the children of Israel on the day of atonement that the high priest would sacrifice for the sins of his own household. And then he would perform sacrifices for the nation. The high priest would go and perform for his house and then for the Israelite community. And the high priest would take two male goats for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering. Then the priest, what he will do is he will bring the animals before the Lord, he will cast lots between the two goats. 
casting lots would be which one is going to be offered up and which one is going to be let go. It's an interesting dynamic because I think the whole picture of atonement here for the scapegoat, also known as the Azazel, I believe is a picture of Christ. I think that the atonement that the Lord provides for those clearly in mercy and in truth, this should be an encouragement for us to walk in the fear of the Lord so that we can depart from evil. So how this kind of unfolds as they cast the lots between the two goats, one would be sacrificed and the other would be the scapegoat. So the first goat was slaughtered for the sins of the people and its blood was used to cleanse or consecrate, if you will, the most holy place, the tent of meeting the altar and these things. And after the cleansing, the live goat, the one who the lots fell on to, to be able to be spared, the high priest was to confess over this goat, over all the wickedness of the people in Israel and the land. And then he would do, in regards to the rebellion of the people, he would take all of their sins, kind of as this gesture, and then he would put his hands on the goat's head. And he would send the goat away into the wilderness. One would be sacrificed. The other would be sent away in the wilderness in care to someone appointed for the task. The goat itself will carry upon itself their sins to a remote place. And then the man shall release it into the wilderness so the scapegoat symbolically took upon the sins of Israel and removed them. For the believer, the scapegoat is Christ. He takes upon the sins. And, and the Bible says God scatters our sins as far as the east is from the west. And it says he remembers them no more. So have you guys sinned as a Christian? Anybody here sinned after you became? Okay. And that one sin that you repented of? Did you ever commit it again? Let's be honest here tonight. Listen, if you're lying, there it is. You've already, you lied again. <laughs> but, but just think about this for a moment. And then we go before the Lord and this is what we say. God, forgive me, I did it again. If you truly repented the first time, the Lord's like, again, what are you talking about? He's not keeping tabs on you. We keep tabs on each other, but God is not. Now, yes, there are things that follow as a result of that, but, but here's the point. Christ Jesus himself becomes our complete atonement for our sins. And Jesus embodies this day, in a sense, of this atonement, this, this atonement that God has provide, provided for his people and for us through Jesus. And, and we are told that our great high priest, according to Hebrews 4, 14, says, since then we have a great high priest, listen to this, who has passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. As we stated this morning in Revelation 13, 8, not only is he our high priest, but he is the lamb that was slain from the creation of the world. As a sacrifice for our sins, he is our scapegoat. Remember there in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, in verse 21, it says, For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Now, it doesn't mean that Jesus became a sinner because he never did. He was tempted in all points and sinned not. Even at the cross, he was an innocent man at Calvary's cross. What Jesus became was not a sinful man, but he became the sacrifice for your sin and for my sin. Jesus took upon himself at Calvary's cross the wrath that we deserve. And ultimately, because he was the sinless Lamb of God, the sinless sacrifice before God, he satisfied that and thus has justified us before God. And as we see that our sins were laid on Christ, just like the hands of the priest laid the sins of Israel on this scapegoat, our sin was laid on Christ and he bore our sin just as the scapegoat bore the sins of Israel. In Isaiah 53 and verse 6, it says, All we like sheep have gone astray. 
we have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. I want us to just kind of stop there for a moment tonight because we're going to prepare our hearts in a time of communion and kind of consider this whole picture of this atonement that God has provided. Now, when I was looking at this, I says to myself, Lord, I'm so thankful that you, in mercy and in truth, provided this atonement for iniquity. In the Old Testament, it was found in the sacrificial system. In the New Testament, it's found in the person and work of Jesus Christ. And you and I have been, like those who would read through the Proverbs, have been recipients of this great grace that God has given. Here it says, mercy and truth. Chesed, right? Mercy and truth. Some, even with the word here, mercy, the word grace is used as well, grace and truth. Remember the psalmist when it was said that the Lord's deliverance would come to Israel when, when, when uh, mercy and truth have kissed? Remember that? I love that picture because when did mercy and truth, when did chesed and truth kiss? When Jesus came to this earth. That's what John chapter 1 verse 14 says. And that word became flesh and we beheld his glory as only begotten of the Father, full of chesed and truth. Mercy and truth kissed when Messiah came. And because of that, Israel's deliverance comes, man's deliverance comes, atonement is provided for, and it says, and by the fear of the Lord, one departs from evil. Notice the benefits of atonement. It frees man to be able to walk in the fear of the Lord. And to walk in the fear of the Lord safeguards one from evil. We depart from it. We have no desire for it. And we can trust in the goodness of the Lord. Amen? Let's bow our hearts and let's pray.